Black holes are considered to be the hellmouths of the universe. Whatever subject falls inside disappears forever. But where to? What is it that exists behind a black hole? What other things vanish there along with space and time? Or are space and time tied together as part of an endless cycle? What if everything that came from the past was actually influenced by the future? What clip is this? I'm sure you're wondering. And maybe one day I'll come up with a dedicated introduction. Nah. Anywho, that's from the Netflix series, Dark. Indeed very Gnostic, although I haven't finished it yet. The pacing could be better, although it's arcane ideas on simulation, retro-causation, Mandela effect, and arconic interdimensional forces are a damn fine cup of coffee. There is only one path through all times, predetermined by the beginning and by the end, which is also the beginning. And they relate to this episode as we go down a wormhole on how Gnostic thought parallels quantum physics and other lofty sciences. Look around because your present might just change after these themes change your past to affect your future or something. But you came to the virtual Alexandria because you discovered long ago that linear time, material realities, and Newtonian universes are just nice but useful fictions deployed by Blake's demiurgic Urizen and his conquest of anything imaginative or innovative. It's all true. It's all real. Nothing here is fake. Nothing you see on this show is fake. It's merely controlled. Personally, I wouldn't put Dark in my top Gnostic television shows of the 21st century, but it's still worth a watch. My list would be this. Number 8, Severance. Number 7, 1899. And that show was created by the minds behind Dark. Number 6, The OA. Number 5, Westworld, Season 1. Number four, Stranger Things, season four. Number three, Legion. Number two, True Detective, season one. And at number one, it's gotta be Twin Peaks, The Return. Shut up! Let me know if I've missed anything, and keep in mind that I've heard amazing things about Silo on Apple TV, but haven't gotten to it yet on me list a whale's vagina but as you can see from all these shows including dark we're living under the spell of a dangerous magician a holographic veil that has kept us asleep and enslaved for many incarnations only our awakening and hypatia revolution against that wickedness in high places is the solution as Dr. King said, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. This reminds me of this quote by the recently deceased Gnostic sage, Cormac McCarthy. It goes, The truth about the world is that anything is possible. Had you not seen it all from birth, and thereby bled it of its strangeness, it would appear to you for what it is. A hat trick in a medicine show, a fever dream, a trance be populate with chimeras having neither analog nor precedent, an itinerant carnival, a migratory tensho 
whose ultimate destination, after many a pitch in many a mudded field, is unspeakable and calamitous beyond reckoning. Yaldabaoth saw his reflection in the light, and the reflection came alive, and it became the universe, this prison. He created desire and love. He created guilt, pain, and even death and the chains that bind us. But none of that is real. It is all a ruse. The words come from the greatest modern Gnostic gospel, along with Valus, Blood Meridian. And they come from the Judge, one of the best representations of the Demiurge slash Urizen, and that of scientism that wants to crush all imagination and innovation. And yes, sometimes the Archons speak the truth, just as demons can quote scripture, according to the New Testament. Just awe-inspiring stuff. So, welcome to the desert of the real. Welcome to Aeon Bite. We don't take prisoners, but liberate them. We are not the final authority on anything, but hope to be an endless possibility for everything. You are the final authority, have always been. My name is Miguel Connor, your pompadus of Gnosis. I am honored by your company and impressed at your amazing potential to create better than the creator gods and their Karens and Katamites in the establishment. We run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. We're writing our own gospel, living our own myth. We certainly embrace this quote from the Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says, If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Randall is an old Zen koan. It goes like this. Everyone has two lives, and the second life begins the moment you realize that all along, You only had one. Ready to bring it all forth? Ready to see beyond the black iron prison to the magical truths of the Gnostics that are actually very scientific today? This is all wrong. For this, I have the honor of hosting Peter Canova to discuss his new book, Quantum Spirituality, Science, Gnostic Mysticism, and Connecting with Source Consciousness. Peter will do a sage task in explaining how Gnostic cosmology and quantum physics go hand in hand, and how the myth of Sophia explains the Big Bang, the holographic universe theory, Einstein's relativity, the secrets of consciousness, and so much more. Fasten your seatbelts, because where we're going, we don't need roads. We could only do about an hour because of both tech and scheduling Archons, even if the interview is complete in its message. As a bonus for all subs, Vance and I bat around the idea of Gnosticism in physics for a while and include other intriguing notions. As more of a bonus, I'll include an excerpt with Anthony Peake where he connects the Pleroma to the Zero Point Field. So don't miss it, as you'll see how insanely right the Gnostics were all along, from the simulation theory to the structure of reality itself, even if I've done so many episodes on this. As Riz Verk said, the simulation theory might be the only place where atheism and theism can come together and work together for a better world. And as David Pierce said, the simulation argument is perhaps the first interesting argument for the existence of a creator in 2,000 years. You're trapped in here, you are. Trapped in what? You said it yourself. We will never know whether the stimuli in our brains are caused by reality or just by the construct of one. Construct of one? This isn't real. Plato's cave allegory. 
You're watching shadows on the wall, and you think that they're the reality. If you don't look over your shoulder, you would see what's causing those shadows. But what did you expect in these Gnostic times, this Philip K. Dick world, and this age of Hermes? The center cannot hold, as Yeats said, and we must let go of the old and tired to embrace the ancient Egyptian wonders of the Gnostics and Hermeticists. All institutions are failing around us as a collective psyche of humanity crumbles, and our only hope is to embrace the pioneering spirit of forgotten alchemists, serpentine witches, and stargate travelers that orthodoxy suppressed to build this machine we've been trapped in for thousands of years. Someday, I'll be a knight. <gasps> a thatcher's son? A knight? You might as well try to change the stars! <laughs> Can it be done, Father? Can a man change the stars? Yes, William. He believes enough a man can do anything. We can give so much meaning and holiness to the universe, discover higher sciences and ways to help the needy, liberate the enslaved. Our potential is limitless, no matter what Yaldi Baldi tells us. As Christopher Morley said, my theology, briefly, is that the universe was dictated but not signed. And as Philip K. Dick wrote, if God is within each man, then the enemy of man is any top-heavy system claiming a monopoly on truth and dispensing it downward. Why eventually will laws be necessary at all? I foresee a godly anarchy. No authority here on earth will have to tell any man what to do, or even educate him. The Logos will do that, link him up. A truly egalitarian society should result. They think we shouldn't put our faith in any human rulers. There's a vast intelligence above the stars that guides us. It's interested in our welfare. A subversive organization guided by a supreme higher power. They think our loyalty should be to the values of that higher entity alone. You believe that too? They called it Velas. I spoke to them in visions. Oh, let us do our interview with Peter Canova. Let's continue discovering that linear time, material realities, and Newtonian universes are just nice but useful fictions. And there is a timeless now where we meet our eternal destiny. And how about some wise words on this, Terence? You know, I've gotten this down to an aphorism, uh, which is... Rome falls nine times an hour and your job as you clean up in the kitchen and fold your socks and go to your job is to feel every time it falls and everything else happening. It all, everything happens nine times an hour and once a day and twice a week and three times a year. It's all going by on different scales and what the actual experience of being alive is is being embedded in this standing waveform of temporal interference. Uh, you know, in linear theory, the most important moment in terms of its effect on this moment is the moment which just preceded this moment. But in this theory, it says, no, the most important moment shaping this moment is a galaxy of moments scattered through time, some of them millions of years ago, some of them seconds ago, some of them centuries ago. And together, they create the incredibly rich, affect-laden environment that we call being a thinking human being paying attention. You see? This is the Aeon Byte interview, and with us we have Peter Canova to discuss a book I really enjoyed and is uh, straight out of the ethos of Aeon Byte, and that is Quantum Spirituality, Science, Gnostic Mysticism, 
and connecting with source consciousness. Peter, thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, great to be with you. Thank you. And with us, too, we've got Vance Saatchi. Vance, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine this wonderful morning. I think our listeners will get more than a quantum of solace from this show. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, Peter, tell us a little bit about your uh, journey of awakening, your journey of gnosis. Uh, you've written three very successful books, Pope Analisa, The Thirteenth Apostle, The Light of Distant Suns, and this is your first nonfiction book. Tell us about the process. Yeah, well, um, for me, it all started uh, long ago and far away, like they say in Star Wars when I was in my 20s. <laughs> and uh, I I had uh, a number of pretty vivid experiences. I found out that I was a very accurate medical intuitive. And then when I pushed the, you know, my rational mind pushed the disbelief aside, it opened up a whole floodgate and I was experiencing, you know, various phenomena, clairvoyance, clairaudience, remote viewing. But in, in all honesty, I came to recognize that what it was, was contact with higher or source consciousness that was really at the root of all of these uh, different phenomenal experiences. So um, being a Capricorn, I wasn't satisfied to just have the experience i wanted to understand what's the nuts and bolts behind this how's this work and uh i started a lifelong investigation which began with looking at various ancient spiritual texts and of course i came across the gnostic texts, which impressed me most of all and from there i went on to quantum physics and the nexus there is that both ancient mysticism and quantum physics essentially deal with two very fundamental aspects of reality which is energy and matter, light energy and matter. So that's really the connection where science is now starting to rub up against ancient Gnostic discoveries. And you could say that the Gnostics were the first quantum physicists or the first real scientists two and 3,000 years ago, um, because out of all the mystical texts and wisdom traditions that I studied, the Gnostics were really the most precise. And in the text, I found, and I, I think I'm perhaps the first person ever to have noticed this because I have not run across this before, but I found very um, profound descriptions of uh, the major theories of quantum physics in there, like the Big Bang, parallel universes, uh, the God particle, and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I wrote this fictional uh, trilogy, the first Souls trilogy that you mentioned, and it did very well. And then I uh, decided to do, you know, compile all the um, research, which was the foundation for the nonfiction trilogy. Uh, I mean, I did 35 or 40 years of research and I said, you know, well, let me share that with the public, too, so that they can, you know, understand what was behind all these thematic concepts in the fictional trilogy and so here we are and quantum spirituality has just hit the markets recently became an amazon bestseller and it's doing pretty well it should yeah and i think it's very relevant peter as uh uh most of my listeners know that i have talked about how for in ancient times the in the west i'm not talking about the east in the west the gnostics were talking about simulation theory we know they got mocked and laughed at uh, and of course, today you've got Nick Bostrom and Elon Musk saying, yeah, it's scientific. Uh, they were talking about these alien beings controlling us from the stars. They got laughed at. And of course, now we know extraterrestrials are mainstream. So much, so much more that the Gnostics were saying. And they, they just, it just jives in our modern days. So uh, I think this is very, this is very important. And also, too, as you write, uh, materialism and scientism are pretty much dead i think the, your book says they have failed us it's time to move on to a third way yeah the, th the third way that i speak of is you know what i call scientific materialism is traditional orthodox science that says you know unless it's provable or testable uh, we can't pay attention to it uh, well i can understand that within uh, a certain sphere of, of study but it also leaves the very hard questions out that they uh, have been sidestepping until now which is well what's the source of all this how does consciousness play a role in fact physicists call consciousness the hard problem uh, that in scientific circles because they haven't traditionally wanted to deal with it but with the advent of what i call the new science of quantum physics this is bumping up against all these questions that that the gnostics faced and 3,000 years ago. So um, the new science, I think, eventually uh, is going to supplant 
the old scientific materialist theory because the new science is starting to recognize that, you know what, it's just very possible that consciousness and light en- is the source of everything in creation and light energy is the vehicle through which that consciousness expresses itself. And there's a growing movement uh, amongst uh, some of these scientists called panpsychism, which is the recognition that consciousness is present and forms every single thing in existence, visible and invisible. It's only a matter of degree and frequency that separates them into different forms of, of things that we uh, recognize in the phenomenal world. And then you have orthodox religion, on the other hand, which hasn't served us very well, because orthodox religion, if anything, has made us feel terrible <laughs> in the long run. I mean, <laughs> orthodox, orthodox religion tells us that, uh, well, number one, we were born in sin uh, because we were these separate creations from the creator, and then we we ticked him off, and then, you know, we're forever trying to get back into his good graces. So we're running around here like little wind-up dolls in a lunatic asylum with no particular purpose except to, you know, appease this angry God. Well, you know, of course, the Gnostics said, nah, that, that, that ain't the way it is. We're not creations, you know, because a creation is something separate from the creation creator pinocchio was a creation of geppetto okay but the gnostics said no we're not creations we're emanations we're actual projections of the very essence of the consciousness that created everything the only difference is we vibrate at a much lower frequency so we don't really recognize the source we come from but you know kind of like picture of a mountain lake and it's pure but it trickles down down the mountain into the valley below but as it trickles down it accumulates all kinds of impurities and and kind of gets a little bit contaminated well it's still part of the source stream but it's 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 at a it's at a lower <laughs> kind of a lower existence so that that's sort of like what we are and our whole purpose here is to raise our vibration to get back to the point where we can actually contact this powerful source consciousness that we are part of Absolutely. And well said. And how would you uh, give a if you had to give a state of the union on where humanity is going? What would you say? I mean, obviously, as we've talked, uh, there's a famous Jung interview where he says the world hangs by a thread. Uh, The psyche is the great danger. And of course, people you and I have quoted Philip K. Dick talking about the empire and how technology is just devouring our consciousness. Do you have a positive or negative outlook for humanity these days? Well, you know, it is touch and go. And, and I, uh, I, I, I am an optimist, so I do um, have overall a positive outlook, but I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I think <laughs> it's going to be an easy road. No. Uh, I, you know, I, I mean, what I, what I look around, I look around at this country and other places, and I see, I see freedoms being eroded every day. And the, the insidious thing about it is freedoms are being eroded under the banner of you know, noble ideals, you know, fraternity, equality, justice, and so forth and so on. But that's not at all what's happening. What's happening is in this country, we're almost going through a a kind of Stalinist, pure, uh, a kind of a, almost like a Stalinist kind of thing with, uh, you know, correct thinking and cancel culture and, uh, you know, all these things that happen with wokeness and so forth and so on. I don't see those as being good trends. I see those, I see those as being ways to corral people's freedoms and control their minds this is just another, you know, you, we talk about the archons and I, I don't normally talk about archons and things like that on my radio interviews because they're not specifically Gnostic shows, but it sounds like, you know, your, your folks oh, are, yeah. are probably a little bit tuned into this. So, you know, you want to talk about archontic influence. Uh, I, I see a lot of that happening now, but it, and it's happening under the banner of progressivism. You know, if you want to be progressive and you want to feel good about yourself and feel nice and liberal about yourself, you know, you subscribe to these things, but in, in actuality, they're divisive. They, they, uh, they 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 make you subject to other people's standards of what should be and how you should talk and how you should think and that's not correct uh, i don't think uh, the gnostics i don't even think our founding fathers would agree to something like that so you know i do see a lot of negative influences out there but i i also think that um you know we're reached a more mature stage where we have information available and if people don't just sit there and swallow the kool-aid of the mass media and other people who are trying to influence them uh that uh, that this thing can be overcome and, and this is part of what my my work is guys part of what my work is is to train people to be their own prophets you know i i often start off my public speaking by saying to people don't believe a damn thing i'm going to tell you <laughs> and they sit there scratching their heads and they say well, what do we pay to come to this for <laughs> and you know uh, w- what i mean is I, I, i'm not telling them don't pay attention don't think about what i'm saying don't reflect on it 
But what I'm saying is don't take anybody else's word for gospel or anything else's for gospel on faith, because the whole purpose of Gnosticism is to graduate from faith to direct experience. Of a higher of a higher power, so I can sit there and tell you that fire burns. But you know what? Until you put your hand on the fire, you don't really know that. You, then you own the truth of it. Once you feel once you feel the, the heat, then you own the truth of it because you have experienced it. Otherwise, you're just taking it on faith. Well, the problem with faith and the problem with belief is they're not always correct. We have a, a lot. Of, a lot of people will, will will spread things under the banner of faith and, and try and change your belief system, but but they're not necessarily correct or what's true. And the only way you can discern truth from falsehood is to go directly to the source itself, and 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 you know become essentially become become your own prophet, have your own contact with a higher kind of knowledge that gives you the guidance to navigate through you know this um, hard knock school that we call the earth here. Oh, well said and agreed. Yeah, I certainly believe like you in a third way. Uh, when people ask, uh, it shouldn't be too, it shouldn't be the right or the left, because both are trying to suppress us and give us this chimera of safety over freedom. You'll be safe if you just give us your soul, which is what the archons want. And of course, I tell people anarchism, they go, what do you mean anarchism? Yes, it means without archons. It's what we want. It's a, the natural state of humanity, if you would. And uh, obviously, the Gnostic said, uh, it's all about self-knowledge. You know, that quote from the Gospel of Philip, you saw Christ, you became Christ. Uh, you wouldn't agree that, or as Elaine Pagel said, Gnosis is knowing yourself and knowing you are God. You would say that's really the, the heart of Gnosis and Gnosticism? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, know yourself to be yourself, but know yourself to be God. That that I think that was the the, the per. I mean, the reason why the supreme source or God projected itself out into other points of consciousness was to reflect upon itself, because to exist is one thing, but to experience is another thing. God or the supreme being can exist. But I think the impetus was to experience and to reflect upon itself from different vantage points. In order to reflect upon yourself and understand yourself, you have to understand yourself in context to other things. There has to be a nexus or a network within which you understand that. So I think the whole purpose of, of creation, of projecting uh, other points of consciousness, was for the supreme being to know itself. And, and I think that in, in that situation, we knew it when we were at a higher state, when we were still, let's say, revolving around the orbit of, of the supreme, of the will of the supreme consciousness, we knew ourselves to be ourselves, but we also knew ourselves to be individuals. Well, as you know, through the story of Sophia, free will was used to, to decide to create on its own and have an experiential track record on its own, apart from the hive mind, apart from the source. And uh, now, there was a split in Gnosticism as to whether that was a mistake or whether that was a purposeful plan. Uh, if you look at the ancient Gnostic text, there was a little division amongst the Gnostics themselves as to the, you know, the, the, the whole, the, you know, the, the real backstory behind the whole Sophia thing. Uh, I, I, I really believe that uh, it was an intentional plan because I don't think anything happens in a way that, um, you know, the Supreme, the Supreme source doesn't encompass in some form, but, I think what what it was really all about is that ultimately the whole move uh, into individuality that culminated with the human soul or the, the spirit in physical body, which is a soul, a psyche, was really about ex having the experience of every single type of existence right on down to the most dense and grounded, which is soul energy in physical form and that's what we are so i see our purpose here as actually being the fingers of god touching the face of this world and our purpose is to spiritualize the material and bring the experience of the material back to spirit and i do envision a time when the veil between these worlds is lifted and it all becomes one and we are able to go back and forth as we were at one time i believe into material forms I, I, th I think at one time we were able to go back and forth between uh, physical forms uh, in and out, but then we started to identify, uh, you know, with the boundaries of our skin as being reality, and we slowly kind of forgot what and who we were, and we sort of became in entrapped in these in these physical forms. But there is a way out, and I think Gnosticism 
you know, directs us to that, that safety valve, that way out. Yeah. Couldn't agree more as uh, I forget it's secret book of John or gospel of Thomas, the way of ascent is a way of descent. It's getting back to the, getting back, tracing the steps and uh, we, we will be there. And yeah, in the Gnostic uh, myth, Sophia falls. And like you said, there was debate and the reason she rebelled, uh, um, but she becomes pregnant with her own negative emotions and her own curiosity, and she gives birth to our friend the Demiurge, and then he mates with his madness, and he creates the Archons. I love that allegory, because when I used to do drugs, I, I, my thoughts would be like children, demonic children, just sort of mating and creating and delusion. What lesson do you tell people about who the Demiurge and, and the Archons is for us, for us humans? Well they're us the, the the first thing we should realize is they're not, i don't i don't see them as these separate um as these separate entities that control us like puppets although the practical effect seems that way M my my view of what happened was that when sophia and this is really interesting it's it, the, the story of sophia is so fascinating because oh, yeah. when she descends into chaos chaos is an exact analog of what scientists call the quantum field or the, the quantum foam. It's the area of potential that has not been organized by the mind of the Supreme. It's the area where things can happen, but have not yet happened in an organized form. So the, the uh, proto matter that they say is in chaos is fascinating because I mean, proto matter, how, how much more clear does it get? That's virtual <laughs> particles. It, it, it's, it's, it's particles before forming into matter, proto matter. So Sophia, her high energy goes in there and activates these pro, the, the proto matter and it swarms around her and essentially she cries out to heaven i'm becoming as lead save me from this you know I'm, I'm becoming as matter save me from this and uh essentially what that story is describing it's 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 a ver very clear description of the god particle by the way but what that story is describing is the formation of matter now the matter that they're talking about at that level is not the physical matter yet that we know. It's more of a finer etheric form of matter, which eventually will become physical. But essentially, the when when the new dimension that's formed by Sophia's action is the psychic dimension, the dimension of psyche or soul, uh, and uh, that uh, is where the demiurge derives its its power out of. Um, but the demiurge really, in a way, they, they say in the text that the demiurge uh, has soul, but not spirit. So, so it, it's not, it, it is a sort of a false construct in a way. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, just like this world, really, when you think of it, is kind of a false construct. It's not the base reality. It seems like Every, it's it's everything to us but that re is really smoke and mirrors that's kind of a, an illusion that we've projected ourselves into because the basic reality is really you know the source the, the source itself so essentially um the the archon and the demiurge really is a um it's a you know almost, almost i don't want to say a mental construct but it's it's sort of like a vibe a certain vibrational construct but we give it power OK, it's our it's our own fears, our own negative emotions that give it power. And when, you know, these spirits started falling into the dimension that Sophia essentially had created in order to have their own experience, um, they uh, it was, you know, it was a fearful experience. It was like kind of being out in the frontier in the Wild West, you know, being surrounded <laughs> by, you know, you know, uncertainty, hostile elements and everything. And and that. That, that negative emotion or negative part of it is sort of what built up the energy of what we call the archons or the archontic influence. So, you know, in, in, in the gospel of Philip, it's what, what, what was the quote in there? It says, uh, uh, men, uh, men, men created gods. Now God, control, God's control men, something to that effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. A very God accurate word. Well, the God should worship us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a very, a very accurate, a very accurate statement. But I think that we should recognize that, um, to a large extent, the the archon, the archontic influence or the archontic energy is really the shadow or dark side of ourselves. No, I would agree, and it makes perfect sense. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you some questions about quantum physics, but I think I might hand it over to Vance. Vance has a uh, better understanding of this. Vance, uh, questions or remarks? Oh yeah, many. Um, on the subject of the ar archons and so forth, um, when you say it's just us, quote unquote, 
uh, wouldn't you have to include, quote unquote, us as systems of humans or combinations of humans and machines um, in which the ideas and motivations actually have a kind of life of their own in beyond the individuals? I mean, the individuals are powering it, but it's kind of like saying one spark plug is powering your whole engine, right? It takes, you know, six or eight spark plugs or four. What do you think of that? Well, well, yeah. I mean, I, I do think that that you know these things become transpersonal centers of energy. You could call them entities or whatever. I do think that that you know that that ha- that that happens. Um, what we got to all always keep in mind that that everything is a unity. So any appearances of dualism are really illusory even though they can have a real effect on us in the dimension we're living in because we you know we've created a dualistic reality here so within that context the, these transpersonal forces um whether you want to call them archons or devils or demons or whatever um yeah you know i i think there there is uh, there is something uh, something to that but the way we cut through that and you know the gnostics were very clear on this when you die these gatekeepers, these thought forms, these beliefs come to bar you from your ascension up to higher levels. And you just have to always keep in focus that that's all illusion. Okay. That's a, that's part of our dualistic thinking. That's part of our dualistic illusion that we've created to experience individuality. It's the price of individuality. So if we just keep in mind that we are part of the Supreme source and, you know, from the Gnostic text, you know, when uh, I think it was in one of the gospels of Mary Magdalene, how she's describing the ascension of the soul and what, what the Christ taught her about the ascension of the soul. She said, you know that's the way you get past these gatekeepers who will come and prevent you or want to hurl you back into the earth yeah yeah that's a good answer um uh, another thing i was wondering is um the spiritual matter right the fine matter that uh existed before uh what you were calling our physical uh world uh came into existence um do you think that 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 matter had uh, similar structures like what we call particles waves all the mathematical functions and so forth does did it have its own laws or are they just a superset of the laws that we have what what were what are your thoughts on the nature of fine matter and, and maybe how it relates to what they're calling dark energy these days well i think dark i think i think dark energy and dark matter certainly are aspects of what i'm talking about for sure uh, you know, it's really it's really hard to say to answer your question or have to be speculative. Um, I I I believe that they follow different mm, physical um, or different um, what can I say uh, different properties, uh, different ways of expressing than what we would experience here in the physical world. So, I mean, one of my one of my theories. Uh, when I talk to UFO or what do they call them now? UAP people, yeah. UFO people. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. One, one uh, I mean, uh, you know, many of them view them as extraterrestrial. I don't. I view them as interdimensional. Uh, I mean, I do think we have visitations, but I think they're interdimensional visitations. And one one of the reasons why I think they seem not to follow the physical laws of our universe is that they, I believe they may bring, have a way of bringing a bubble of their own physical laws into our dimension, kind of like a bubble in effect, which would account for the ah. reason why these these vehicles are able to do you know really weird things at rapid angles and everything else. It, it it's it's not because maybe they're so technically advanced, it, but it, it's the fact that they've found a way to at least for short periods of time incorporate their physical laws into our into our universe and perform within that sphere or energy sphere or bubble. Interesting, yeah. Um, you know, um, I've often thought, and I wonder if you agree with me, that um, even though science says, oh, you know, there's no proof of anything uh, beyond physical reality and so forth, that they omit one interesting thing, which is where do all these laws come from? You know, like w- w- what provides the consistency of uh, the nature of physical reality throughout the universe. And I don't think science has any really good answers to that, unless it's the soliton theory, like there's all really only one particle and it time shares itself, but it, that's kind of equivalent to the monad, <laughs> right? I mean, it all, it, it all, it all is mind energy. I mean, a lot of scientists are starting to understand that the universe and everything in it operates more like a great thought than a great machine. And that 
um, you know, back in the day when they started doing these experiments, like the double slit experiment, and they realized that, um, that uh, really the fundamental levels of reality are not particles. In fact, even Max Planck, who was the grandfather oh, yeah. of quantum physics, gave quantum physics its name, said that uh, he had a famous quote that said, you know, I can tell you this much. There is no such thing as matter that matter it, that the appearance of matter is an intelligent force that brings atoms and molecules to a vibration a certain vibration so what he was telling us is what many scientific experiments after max planck proved out which is that there are no such thing as particles at the fundamental levels of reality there's only waves of energy but under circumstances these waves of energy can collapse into denser forms that we call particles and uh the famous Copenhagen interpretation, Niels Bohr uh, was one of the pioneers of quantum physics, and you know his view of things is called the Copenhagen, inter Copenhagen interpretation. And in the Copenhagen interpretation, what they found out in the laboratories is that when uh, human observation enters into the equation, these energy waves collapse into observable particles, and that's where the whole uh, kind of thing came from the, about, you know, how we're co-creators that, we, you know, we, we have an effect. And, it, and I really do believe that is true. Um, very diluted effect, but depending upon how, you know, what our, frequ our particular frequencies are. But we are part of the one energy stream that emanated us into being you know it th think of it like this i think of the supreme source as the energy as the the source energy okay but we're like the relay stations in an electrical grid and it it, it it sends its energy out and we modulate that energy through our own consciousness or or the vehicle of our own consciousness and that participates in the whole stream of creation so i do believe that we were involved in the whole creative process uh and i believe that um the lower dimensions that they talk about gnosticism were part of our creation that lower vibration that we use to sort of create the psychic and the physical dimensions so um you know the the, the, the the getting back to your question of what's the nature of of these particles they're really kind of illusory. They're really not real to begin with, but they become real under certain circumstances and under certain conditions, and they appear as reality to us. But think about it this way. We know, okay, that, that the, the, so, the so-called solid visible world that we experience is made of unsolid, part, uh, un, unsolid things like atoms and molecules. Atoms are 99% light, space, and energy, and only 1% mass. We concentrate on the 1%, and we have no idea, no clue about the 99% that it comes from. That's our big task is to, 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 to slowly discover the nature of that 99%. So, um, you know, uh, there, there can be many different forms of matter vibrating at different frequencies. And it's all a matter of gradation. You know, it, it, the, lower the, the lower the vibratory energy or frequency, the more solid things appear. Uh, appear. And that's the basis of the God particle. Um, the God particle, you see, scientists have no idea where energy comes from. They can manipulate it, but they don't have a clue what it is and where it comes from. Energy comes into our universe, and we have a field that surrounds this universe called the Higgs field. And incidentally, they proved this in, in, in um, 2012 uh, with the, the Hadron Collider over there in Europe. They found the God particle, the Higgs boson. The Higgs field has these things in it, these virtual particles in it called Higgs bosons. And when energy comes into our universe, the Higgs bosons attach themselves to these rapidly moving high energy streams and they slow them down. They slow them down. Think of like, you know, shooting a BB gun through a, a pool of jello. They, they slow, they slow, they slow the momentum down until the frequency becomes such that they start to take on mass. Now, this is parallel, exact parallel to the story of Sophia. So what happened to Sophia? Her high energy enters in, the protomatter surrounds her, they lower her energy vibration, and matter starts to form. I mean, it, it's, it's just so clear that they were describing the God particle, you know, two or 3,000 years ago. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating how these things work. They should call it the Demiurge particle then. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of. the mouth particle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the audience... Uh... Peter's book has got all the philosophical, mythic uh, content that I like, but he also has charge, charts, math, 
uh, he quotes all these great physicists for the modern Gnostic like man. So there's something there that you understand and he makes a good case. And just uh, off the on a little side note, Peter, are there, are there any Gnostic gospels that you find are your favorites or really speak to you? Any preferences? Um, Philip. Philip, yeah. Apocrypha of John, um, the Gospel of Truth. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think probably right off the top of my head, those three. Yeah, I would say those are, yeah, those would be mine too. Uh, do you like Thunder, Perfect Mind? Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful for divine beautiful, feminine. beautiful beautiful description of the divine feminine the of uh, I, you know i am the whore and i am the divine one it, it's a beautiful um description of uh of the the duality that sophia uh immerses herself in when she leaves the orbit of heaven she she was the first one to break the unity of heaven and that was the first fall. I mean, we talk about the fall in the Bible, but the, there's there's more. There right. was more than one fall. The first fall was Sophia breaking from that unity into, you know, a world of um, what essentially was a world of duality. And yeah, no, the Thunder Perfect Mind is is um, from a poetic standpoint brilliant. Oh, it's it's gorgeous. So that would lead to my le- next question: Why did we humans suppress the divine feminine, Sophia, Athena, Isis, all these? all this dimension of energy why do we suppress it and the perennial philosophy well you know um where this was a very patriarchal world back in the time of the gnostics and uh i think the fact that the female leaders uh of the uh, gnostic well first of all i'm sure your audience knows but let's make this clear gnostics predated christianity but they became amongst the first christians because they recognized that jesus was teaching a gnostic message so they became amongst the very first christians and they would be the foundation of what we call the mystical church there was another parallel church going on which was the church the outer church uh, the, 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 what I would call the church of the parables, the church, the public, uh, the church of the public message. And we know this very clearly because it was even stated in the Bible that right. Jesus had two teachings. He, in, in all the synoptic gospels, it said that unto the disciples, he gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven, but unto the masses, he spoke in parables. And then we have the letters from Clement of Alexandria and Origen and other church fathers attesting to the fact that there was a secret or hierophantic teaching uh, of the Christ. So that, um, that, dual teaching evolved two churches. There was the inner mystical church, and then there was the outer church. The outer church pretty much became the church that we know today, the church of hierarchy, of dogma, uh, so forth and so on. It was the church of misunderstandings. It, it had definite elements of Gnosticism in it, but grossly misunderstood uh, and, and warped, uh, warped those teachings, which is exactly why the mystical teachings were um oral in the first place because they were afraid that these teachings would become corrupted and bastardized so the the uh, females were largely the head of this mystical church as we see in the gnostic text mary magdalene and other females were mentioned in there as being very prominent and that that's not really very surprising because when you think of it part of being female is being intuitive more you know tends to be more intuitive than the male side and intuition is the gateway to higher consciousness. Feeling and intuition is the gateway. Not that logic and organization don't play their parts. They do. They need to work hand in hand. But um, I, I really believe that the door opener for um, having these um, experiences with the higher consciousness or realigning with higher consciousness starts with uh, sort of the, the feminine aspects of uh, intuition. And, and incidentally, that doesn't mean that that's just exclusively present in females. We all have male and female in us, anima and animus, as uh, Carl Jung used to say. But, you know, if, if it's more pronounced, okay, so for me, uh, I'm probably... Uh, I, I was told that I was like the ideal blend of left and right, <laughs> left and right brain. I, I, I'm both, you know, like a logical businessman, but I also have this intuitive side to me. And I use both of them, you know, as the X and Y axis to do quantum spirituality. In the books that I did, I, I employ both science, logic and, and spirituality. But in any case, um, what happened was when the, uh, when the outer church, uh, which was mostly male dominated, um, decided that they wanted to end the persecutions of the Roman Empire, they said, well, we need to be accepted as a state religion of Rome. So they were competing with other religions of that era to become the state religion of Rome. And having so many females, um, you know, in, in leadership positions of, of, of the church, 
became an embarrassment. So gradually they started to move the females out and they started to eradicate uh, the, 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 and suppress the mystical teachings and the female aspects of the church uh, in favor of uh, uh, the, um, you know, more uh, male dominated, uh, you know, kind of story that developed about the Christ and, you know, with all the mystical trappings and everything else, because, you know, it, there certainly was a divine aspect to the Christ, but in actuality, um, he was really, you could consider him more of a Gnostic teacher. And the Christianity at that time was called the way. It wasn't called Christianity. Nobody ever, nobody would know what a Christian was back in those days. It was called the way, which indicates to us that it was a spiritual teaching. It was a spiritual path that he was teaching to higher consciousness. So the church then takes it and they start to develop all kinds of dogmas and supernatural things and everything else. And they build up this story to compete with all the other myths of the Roman empire to eventually become adopted uh, as the state religion. And they were successful and they pretty much eradicated the female leadership and eradicated the mystical church because the mystical church said, we don't need you guys. We don't need priests. We don't need a church to get to God. We're, we are God. We, we just, we need to remember. That's what our task is we need to remember what we are we don't need to have you be the intercessor to tell us you know what to do no it makes sense and, and while we're a little geeking out here uh jesus and mary magdalene simon magus and helen do you think they're one and the same or two different power couples for the gnostics <laughs> oh i i th i think they're different I think they were, I, I, I mean, I think there were similarities uh, into, you know, because look, Gnosticism always was very strongly conscious of the balance between the yin and the yang and the male and the female. So it's, it's no surprise that in Gnostic circles, you would have couples like that, as opposed to one or, you know, one or the, the other. But of course, you see what happened with the Orthodox churches, they decoupled them. <laughs> so Mary Magdalene, <laughs> Mary Magdalene kind of gets erased uh, right. in the figure of Jesus, you know, getting thrust to the forefront. Yeah, yeah. And as I always like to say, uh, Simon and Ellen are like the Rolling Stones. Jesus and Mary are like the Beatles. One's doing sex magic and partying. The other one's a little more, more conservative. But yeah, yeah. I agree with you 100%. An element there was an element of that uh amongst the gnostics the, the simon magus thing and i and that was later used to criticize the gnostics that they were into orgies and and, and everything else i mean i mean there, there probably was some you know sort of tantric uh yeah. kind of influence of the gnostics back then like there was in hinduism which incidentally a lot of gnosticism to me you know involves uh, hindu influences uh yeah. and influences from the Zoroastrian they were they were like the melting pot of the wisdom traditions you know Kabbalistic Judaism Hellenistic uh, mysteries um, you know Zoroastrianism Hinduism you see strains of that uh, all around Alexandria which was the headquarters of the Gnostics at that time exactly and people need to remember that the, the Egyptians practice sex magic and that sort of tantric stuff and you would say you mentioned Peter that the Gnostics are earlier than Christianity you say that they're were they the heirs of the ancient Egyptian mysteries, Jewish mysticism, or what's your theory on their origins? Well, I mean, originally, I think the, the thought came from the Far East. I would probably, you know, look at Hinduism as the root because that really was the, the, the foundation spiritual expression that we know of. I mean, th they were certainly things that came before it, but we just don't historically know it during the shamanic era 12,000 years ago. Uh, I, I mean, I think the perennial philosophy and the wisdom tradition, you know, r really passed through thousands and thousands of years. But um, I think the Gnostics probably, uh, I think their highest expression was, was, around, it was around Alexandria, Egypt in the centuries uh, before Christ. Um, because by that time they had been able to absorb uh, so many different things: the Hermetic Egyptian tradition, um, the, the the Greek uh, the Greek mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries, the Jewish Kabbalah, uh, and Zoroastrianism and Hinduism. These were all strains that they were exposed to, and um, it was you know uh, they 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 essentially tied the knot together in my view. Mm -hmm. And acts really probed the other dimensions and brought back solid information that we could use in this world in a way that we're doing with quantum physics today and, and, and theories of quantum physics. So that's why I say they were seem to be the most precise and practical 
uh, of, of all the mystics that I ran across. Oh, again, I agree. And then later on, of course, the Manichaeans went even crazier with it. Mani just tied every religion, Buddha and Zoroaster. And we can have this universal perennial religion right here, right now. And of course, you know what happened to the Manichaeans? They got crushed as even worse than the Gnostics. But well, that's yeah, why. Like you... And the Cathars. And the Cathars. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. But that's why we are here right now. People like us, we're not getting crushed so far. And like, yeah, the Sufis were have been persecuted. The Kabbalah has been mocked by mainstream Jews over and over. Um, but uh, so you also say, too, that you believe Jesus came from the scene school, right? That would be what separates him a bit from others. I do believe that he grew up with uh, an Essene influence. I mean, you know, the headquarters of the Essene. Now, incidentally, we have to understand that there were Essenes and there were Essenes. A lot of people equate the Essenes with the um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that that group around right. Qumran. Uh, they were, but they they were very, very different. They were a really um, conservative, male dominated, ascetic group, uh, and uh, they 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 were only loosely related to the Essenes that were headquartered around Mount Carmel, who had families and, uh, you know, they were much, uh, much uh, more relaxed in their uh, social practices. And, and Jesus grew up under the shadow of Carmel. And uh, I, I do believe that there was a strong influence there. And I also believe that when the family fled to Egypt, that there was an Essenic community around Lake Mariotis, of, uh, which largely would have been a Jewish Essenic community. And uh, probably that's where they, they spent their time when they went to Egypt. Makes sense. And I uh, also like to, uh, I think you'll like the story, Peter. Uh, before I was going to read your book that evening, I had this weird uh, uh, desire to read the Pista Sophia. I don't know why, because the Pista Sophia is like the the war and peace of the Gnostic Gospels. It's a yeah. monster. Uh, it, sometimes it, it is. <laughs> No, no, you're right. You're right. I, I give you credit. Incidentally, if you read that, I really give you a lot of credit. <laughs> Not in one sitting. No, I had my thing. I, I was curious about Authades, the Aeon. I don't know why, because it just hit me and I started reading the, you know, the the chapter where Authades is this Aeon who tricks Sophia. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm still always so confused. I mean, he's an Aeon. And he gets jealous of Sophia, and he's the reason that she falls. And how could you have an evil Aeon, blah, 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 in my head? But then I read your book. I'm like, oh, well, thank you. It's like the universe answered my question yeah. before I could. So maybe tell the audience about the truth of Authades for those who have read The Pist of Sophia and are wondering about it, too. <laughs> uh, well, it, it means Othadis. Othadis in Greek means audacity. Um, it's you can see a direct relation to the English word. Their Indo-European language is "otadis," means audacity. And um, what uh, what I what I essentially said in the book was that there was always a principle of opposition right from the beginning, and there had to be a principle of opposition because when the supreme being um, uh, projected the aeons in order to ha- in order to truly be individuals, they had to have free choice. They had to have free will. Apart from aligning with the will of the one, they had they they had the choice to align with their own will or pursue their own will, which is what Sophia did. Okay, so uh, Othades or Othades was the um, was this was this principle of opposition operating at the at the higher realms at the higher levels, and it was uh, the Gnostics said it was Othades that that uh, tricked Sophia. Uh, into believing that she would be able to create on her own, uh, you know, if she um, went into went into chaos and so forth. So I, I see, I see Othadis as the spiritual ancestor of of the, the demiurge or the archon at a lower level. The archon was operating operating at a lower level. Othadis was operating at a higher level. The lower the lower these iterations get the more you say they take on contamination or, or aspects of what you could call evil uh, or deviation from, from the source. So uh, I would say that the, the, uh, the Demiurge was the um, spiritual ancestor in some ways of Athadis because it represented the principle of opposition, opposition to the light and so forth. Now, at the higher levels, that was not evil. It was just a matter of free choice, okay? At the lower levels, uh, that free choice can get really abused. That that kind of explains it. No, that makes sense. And for the audience, uh, Sophia falls into chaos. 
tricked by auth aids or and then she there's this triple power lion face that is sort of part of auth aids drains her power and then she has to do the famous long prayers and calls for the aeon jesus she's stuck there in the 13th aeon and then everything will be better i always want to do like an action movie where jesus goes up and like fights auth aids or something like tom cruise but that's in my head rescues the damsel in distress uh, but it's a big story and uh as we were getting a little closer to the end uh people may be wondering okay the, i agree with you peter this is something i want to follow i want to look into i'm, I'm going to double check your stuff but what can i do to as they say raise my vibrations or uh in fact let me back up because you yourself said you're a left and right brain person but you yourself write that you were born already sort of with your one foot in the mystical world you, there's one story which may, gave me the chills where you're in africa with your father and you're in the wilderness and your father stops the truck and you get an intuition that this is danger and you got I drive off and you later find out yes there were uh, bandits there dangerous bandits or you talk about you get off on an airplane and something tells you you've left two pieces of paper under your chair and you run back into the airplane and you find these two very important documents so you yourself were already mystic uh, so i guess the question is what is everybody a mystic and what path can they do to open their channels i'm i'm nothing exceptional uh it went up until i was in my 20s i never even realized any of this was possible uh, i'm i'm a i'm still a businessman an international businessman so i'm not really the profile for somebody who you would be on your show uh and have all these experiences but i did why i don't really know i the only thing i can explain is that i always had a burning desire to understand the bigger picture of life like you know the the deep questions like what are we here for you know what's our purpose and everything else and so i i made i i think that that vibration opened up the channel for me to find those answers because I just had such a burning desire of knowledge. Uh, and maybe that's what triggered all this for me. But, you know, I go into the book because all that, look, the book is a roadmap and like any roadmap, it has two coordinates. You either have, you know, north, you know, have, have X and Y axis or latitude and longitude. In this case, the two coordinates that I use are uh, quantum physics and Gnostic wisdom, but it, it really is a roadmap for people's spiritual journey, but what, providing the knowledge and, and the facts and all the other things I have in the book are like signposts for people, but ultimately it has to come down to an individual incorporating that in a way that can be meaningful in their life in, in a useful, practical sense, because I don't like to just deal in useless knowledge. I, I, I like practical results, which is why I started studying how I was able to do all this stuff to begin with. So I have chapters in there where it talks about um, about 12 different steps or, or, or elements or attributes related to meditation and how people can use those things in their own meditational practice to help open up these channels um, for this information to come through. Because the information is like a, a cosmic radio it's broadcasting 24 seven. It's just up to us as individuals to keep tuning that dial until we hit the frequency and we can hear the station, right? Yeah, that's, that's what they have to do when they listen to anybody's radio station. You have to dial to hit it. So that, that, you know, when I, when I tune that dial and I hit that, I realized there was information that was being broadcast on a 24 seven basis, but I have been ignorant of it for, you know, my life prior to then. So what, what, what I, what I do have in the book is uh, I devote several chapters to talking about how all, all this information can be brought to bear in a person's own experience, but it takes the work. You just can't sit in a chair and it's not going to explode in bells and whistles like it does in Hollywood. You've got to put the work in, you know, and, and it begins with de the desire uh, to understand the world. It begins with, uh, let me put it to you in the most simple terms I can. Okay. Spiritual knowledge is like a pyramid. Yeah. The, the, the top or apex of the pyramid is the, the highest expression. So what do you want to do in life? You want to live down at the bottom in the basement? Or do you want to see, see the panorama of life from the top and get the, get the penthouse view? If your desire is to get in that penthouse, that's the first step that's going to help propel you to having these experiences. So I, but I cover all these different attributes of how people can actually incorporate all this 
information and psychology, spiritual wisdom, quantum physics, and everything to bring it to practical bearing for their own life. Vince, as we get towards the end, any questions? Yeah, um, along those lines, Peter, um, was there a catalyst to your original mystical experience? Uh, I mean, it sounds like um, your experience was uh, very similar to one I had when I was a teenager that got me started on all this. And what started me was the actual experience of kind of a mind melding between me and a blind gal on the telephone. But um, not to elaborate on that, um, can you think of what the catalyst was for your experience? Because if we could get other people to seek the initial experiences, maybe people could get sparked and, you know, have their own experiences more easily. Alienation. I think it was a sense of, <laughs> I think, I think it was a sense of alienation. Yeah, very Gnostic, right? <laughs> and that, and that I, I didn't, um, I, 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 I just didn't somehow, I mean, look, I, I, I I had a pretty good life, you know, when I was growing up in high school and everything. I mean, I was fairly popular. I played sports and everything else. So it wasn't like I was a, a nerd in a basement or something like that. But, you know, uh, I, I still had this sense of alienation that I, I, I didn't feel like I quite fit in. And, and I, I, I just had this, like I said, I had this urge to understand what life was about, why, why I was here. And, and I think that desire to do that was probably my catalyst to open up the frequencies that we talked about. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has to be alienated to, to do this or feel alienated to do this. I think different people arrive at this through many, you know, many different paths. But I do think that there are elements that we can identify that help us, um, you know, to, to tune into the frequency that uh, that we we spoke about. But I would like to say that um, if people could go to my website, peterconova.com, that's P-E-T-E-R-C-A and ova.com um there's a wealth of information on the website um you can get to my podcasts from there uh learn about the books uh and um it it, it just gives kind of a good overview of the body of work i have um and if it's of interest to people they, of course they can um order the book through there or through amazon uh or any of the online booksellers or bookstores or whatever so you know i hope um you know people are curious enough because this this is like this is like a, a what do they call it? A visitor's guide to the cosmos. I mean, it really covers psychology, science, you know, molecular biology, a whole bunch of factors that enter in into um, you know how our how we perceive our reality. Yeah, you can do so much more in a book than a short podcast, right? Sure. Do you think that there's a way to actually commune with the one and have it help you in your life travels? Oh yeah, well, that, that's what we've been taught. That's what this is all about. That's that's what I'm saying. I mean, it changed my life. Um, first of all, um, you know, I don't even know if I could have written these books without, you know, I wouldn't have written these books without these experiences, and I don't think they would have been ex as, as successful as they were. I mean, Pope Annalisa, uh, the first book of the trilogy, um, Ohm Times Magazine did a whole article on all the geopolitical uh, things that came true in the book, like um, the second Gulf War, Iran going nuclear, uh, the rise of a third world pope who would not take a typical papal name, but keep his own name, which is Francis. I mean, all, all, all these, uh, I mean, there were so many things that were predicted years before they happened in Pope Annalisa that they did this uh, online magazine article on it. Uh, sometimes I felt like I didn't even write the book myself. I felt like somebody else wrote it because it was information that was being channeled, you know, through me. Uh, and, um, you know, this, this, uh, absolutely people, uh, this is what this is all about is contacting this higher source of consciousness that guides you. Okay. One of the things that I caution people though, is you have to be open to understanding how the guidance comes through. It's not going to come through necessarily in literal words that says, do this, do that. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, manif it, man it manifests, you know, in, 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 in subtle ways, but you know, um, I, I became unlike Edgar Casey, uh, unlike Edgar Casey, who was uh, the sleeping prophet. I mean, for me, it came through while I was conscious, uh, and 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 I I would I would you know get vibrations of people when I was a, a medical intuitive. All I had to do was be near somebody, and I'd know what was going on with them. Was one of the reasons I stopped doing <laughs> medical intuition because it, <laughs> it got to be too much after a while. But no, absolutely, absolutely. The answer to your question is yes. You most definitely can contact this higher source of information because it's there yeah it's your daemon and it will give you your purpose where you need to go to heal the universe 
Oh, one last question as we get to the end. Uh, Peter, if you can indulge us, favorite Gnostic theme movies. Do you have any? Um, Dark City. Oh, uh, good one. Um, well, of course, the Matrix trilogy. Of course. I mean, yeah, that's I mean, always a given. <laughs> it's, the most obvious, it's the most obvious one, but uh, Dark, Dark City. Um, you know, I know Philip Dick wrote the Blade Runner, but um, I, I didn't see the Blade Runner as being. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what the what the, one of the most Gnostic works of art is, and I dearly hope they make it into a movie because the rest of the franchise did fabulously well. Is Tolkien the Silmarillion? Oh, Tolkien, yeah. to, Tolkien's cosmogony, Tolkien's world uh is is absolutely gnostic yeah the fall of melkor and all that you're right yeah it doesn't really come through as much in 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 you know the 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 trilogy and some of the other things but um if you go to the silmarillion which is the source story it's it's a thoroughly gnostic story and uh, it's my favorite uh i i love the silmarillion more than any other tolkien's works and i hope one day somebody makes it into a faithful um you know faithful adaptation Agreed 100%. Well, awesome. Well, you said uh, PeterCanova.com is where they should go. I'll have this on the show notes. Anywhere else you need to send the audience or news you need for the audience? Well, I do have another website for people who are specifically interested in the trilogy, um, PopeAnalisa.com, P-O-P-E-A-N-N. A-L-I-S-A dot com. That is the first book of the trilogy, which I'm working on with uh, some partners now to get adapted into a television series. And oh, wonderful. Hope, hope to know some, something better on that in the next 30, 60 days. Um, but uh, you can also access the trilogy through the Peter Canova website. So either of those two websites are, um, you know, would be helpful. Awesome. Well, again, we'll have it on the show notes, but uh, we are at the end. First, Vance, thanks for keeping us company. Oh, it was a great experience uh, hanging out with a fellow mystic. <laughs> I may I may sound a little bit unmystic when I ask you the questions, but you got to remember I ask them in behalf of the audience too, Peter. So I understand. I, I got the same broadcast you did. Wonderful. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, and we look forward to our next time. And there you have it, you shining crazy diamonds. Peter Canova takes us to the heart of consciousness and the farthest shores of cutting science. All with Gnostic thought. A hunka hunka burning gnosis. As mentioned in the intro, this is the full interview. As a bonus for all subs, Vance and I bat around the idea of Gnosticism in physics for a while and include other intriguing notions. As more of a bonus, I'll include an excerpt with Anthony Peake where he connects the Pleroma to the Zero Point Field. Don't miss it, and please become an AB Prime member, Red Circle subscriber, or Patreon for all the extra quantum bells and whistles. There is a plan for your needs and budget out there, and it helps keep the lights of the Pleroma on and grow this Red Pill Cafeteria. Don't forget my voice over availability, Amazon wishlist, or merch store if you want to get involved in the revolution of the spirit and the mind. Definitely don't forget the Virtual Alexandria Academy, the one and only online Gnostic course. For non-subs, thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. It's been an honor for this episode. For all subs, let us to our bonus with Vance and me, and then Anthony Peake on connecting the Pleroma to the Zero Point Field. <laughs>